This is Mike Madrid, and you're listening to Red County, Blue County, Orange County, produced by UC Irvine School of Social Ecology. Thirty years ago this year, Proposition 187, a citizen-led initiative designed to deny social services, including non-emergency health care and public education, to undocumented immigrants, was overwhelmingly approved by California voters. The measure sent a shockwave through the political system, and its reverberations would be felt throughout the country for decades. Conservative Orange County activists Barbara Coe and Ron Prince authored the initiative that they called the Save Our State Initiative. It was a measure largely accused of speaking to racist, nativist motives. Gene Pasco, who covered Orange County politics as a reporter during the 80s and 90s for the Orange County Register and then for the Los Angeles Times, talks about the county's turning point. Are you surprised looking back that Prop 187 started with Barbara Coe and the Save Our State Initiative in Orange County? Um, not really, because Orange County demographically was starting to change. And there, you know, Orange County has always been a place of opportunity for people. And um, if you're feeling threatened, your first response is going to be, who else can I blame? <laughs> you know, people don't tend to be introspective, you know, when it comes to that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, I think they were looking certainly looking at that. But I think that, you know, Barbara Coe and folks like that, um, they, you know, they, I, I never thought of them really as like Reagan Republicans, because, you know, uh, in it, it, with 84 and the, and the amnesty and stuff, that was, that was Reagan. Here, Gene is referring to the Immigration Reform and Control Act, or IRCA, signed by Ronald Reagan in 1986, and was the last immigration reform measure passed in this country, which granted amnesty to nearly 6 million undocumented immigrants. They didn't like that kind of thing, and they certainly were fighting um, any other effort to try to do that. Um, but I think it was, it, there's always been a faction of uh, bunkerism uh, in Orange County. I'm not sure if it exists other places, because I haven't lived a whole lot of other places. I'm I'm in Florida now, and it's um, I don't get that same bunker mentality, um, and, and I'm not I'm not sure why, but it, it Orange County may have been insulated for a long time because opportunities were only available to certain, you know, certain types of folks. But as Orange County grew and more people came in and and the opportunities got spread around, frankly, through, you know, education, a lot of other things that were available to people. Um, you know, I, I think there were some folks that just reacted like, wow, I've always loved this place the way it was, and I'm now threatened. Um, you know, you're seeing a little of that still in places like Huntington Beach, um, you know, where, uh, you know, people have, have nostalgia for the way things were. And, and while, the, you know, that's fine if you can acknowledge reality uh, rather than go negative and say, okay, well, I'm going to force the way I like things, you know, back on everybody else. Really, to me, the kind of the dark tone came in with Prop 187, Pete Wilson in 94. And all of a sudden, uh, you had seen a, you know, the, the campaign ads that were promoting uh, candidates, promoting ideas, promoting politics. And really, that one started to be the first kind of demonization uh, the us versus them. And it has started really, I think, in 94 and then just kind of amped up from there. And do you think it was just the confluence of this, these these changes, the, the, the changing blue collar economy, the defense spending, the engineers, um, you know, Rockwell, as you mentioned, McDonnell Douglas, Hughes Aircraft, all of these massive companies start changing and they leave because there's no more Cold War economy. And then the rise of Latino residents, documented and undocumented, coming two major tectonic shifts politically and socially. And then and then again, Prop 187 starts in Orange County. You want to talk about that environment a little bit, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it it did shift to kind of an us, us versus them. I mean, uh, Orange County had always been uh, for the longest time, you know, demographically 
quite homogenous for the most part. Um, you had uh, the people in control kind of all looking <laughs> the same, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, then you, as the as the county changes demographically, a lot, lot of more uh, Latino uh, residents come in, um, Asian residents come in, and you're seeing this kind of you know, demographic shift. Well, obviously, that's going to have an impact. Uh, you know, I think Prop 187 still uh, is detrimental to Republicans in the state of California because of that of that such negative message, and it kind of resonates because you're now you're seeing a lot of negative messaging at the national level coming from Republicans. And if folks feel like like you know you don't you know you you your candidates don't look like me and they don't like people that look like me um you know that that has such a corrosive effect um and and also demographically things were starting to get a little bit younger uh with orange county you had a, you know a lot more younger people moving in having families um and so you know at this point when you look at the demographics and who are the Republican voters in Orange County, and this is something uh, you you have done with the poll and UCI has done with the poll, um, a lot of those very staunch Republican voters are 65 and over. They're, they're older voters. Um, they're more likely to say they want to leave because the county doesn't look like it looked like 40 years ago when they had a, more of a comfort zone, right? And so... Um, you know, now, uh, I, you know, I've been in Florida, but, but I, I still have my house in Costa Mesa and I've watched how things, how things have changed demographically in Costa Mesa. Um, and it's, um, it, it's just a, a much more fluid, diverse, uh, political environment now. Uh, and, and frankly, I think that's a good thing because whenever you have monoliths, um, it, it just, Things tend to erode um, over time. I mean, you can't you can't just have one majority view that is always imposing itself on everybody else. You know, there's a lot of prognostication going on about what's going to happen. And I think you know, uh, for California as a whole, because as you know, as Orange County goes, I think we'll see that happening uh, in the rest of the state. Because if you look at the concentration of for voter registration. I mean, it used to be, it was kind of blue right along the coast. And then it was a huge swath of red. But now if you look at it, it you know, the blue is is creeping outward. There's still red, you know, along the, along the state boundaries to the east. But there's a lot of just a lot more diversity. People are moving into different areas and they're taking their broader uh, ideologies with them. And so I think, I think, you know, people look at California and, and I, there hasn't been a, a constitutional, a Republican constitutional officer elected since what, the early nineties. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a huge amount of time for one party to be in control of California. I, I so I think we're going to see that spreading kind of that diversification that we're seeing in Orange County spreading throughout the rest of the state. Um, and, but again, it, it matters what the messages are that are coming out. And if all the messages are us versus them, and it's not just, you know, kind of from the right, but from the left, because the, the rhetoric is, is almost the same. If you strip out the personalities, it's very much us versus them. And, uh, you know, personally, I hope that we, that there's a revolt and people go, you know what? we're all Californians, we're all Americans, let's work together. That's That was the whole point of what the founders came up with, was to work together. And the first guy to raise the alarm about partisan politics was George Washington. I mean, you know, he, he, he knew how corrosive it was. Um, so it's, uh, I, I think there's lessons uh, for California and hopefully the rest of the country out of the, the purpleness of Orange County. I'm headed now to Santa Ana, a large city with a 75% Latino population that sits right in the middle of Orange County and holds about a third of all Orange County's residents. I find our meeting place, the Alta Baja Market, a mix of Venice Beach meets Hipster Lounge 
and I take a seat in the bright marketplace. The colorful shop is owned by Gustavo Arellano and his wife Delilah. Gustavo was a Los Angeles Times columnist who grew up in Anaheim during the 1990s. I wanted to really tap into your brain today about some of the most profound changes that you've experienced during your life, which was the ethnic transformation of Orange County, um, the earthquake of Prop 187 yeah. back in the day, yeah. right, 1994. Mm -hmm. uh, you're in middle school at this time, oh, I think, right? Freshman, uh, sophomore in high school. Sophomore high well, school. Well, when the vote happened for 187 in November, I was a sophomore in high school, but obviously the whole lead up to 187 and even the year before 1993 when the california state legislature was passing all these anti-immigrant uh resolutions that was when i was in eighth grade going into ninth grade and yeah. do you remember all of that legislation working its way none politicas was not where you were focused i was a nerd i was focused on staying alive i was being bullied non-stop not by white kids by mexicans on one hand just because i was a nerd on another hand because i wasn't mexican enough mm -hmm. I, I i did not realize in my own podcast on 187 i talk about how when i finally realized this whole thing over 187 was one day i was i went to anaheim high school so i'm walking home from anaheim high and a, you know two white kids they're driving a pickup truck and they yell at me 187 and i didn't know what that was i'm like well, all right you're yelling numbers but then i got home and then i saw oh proposition 187 wants to do this this would have been like late September, because it was early on in the school year, because then once I realized what Prop 187 was, then I started to see the things around me. Then that's when I realized that there was going to be school walkouts. There was a walkout at Anaheim High. I didn't participate because I was scared. Can we cuss in this? Yeah. I was scared shitless, very, very scared, and getting in fights with my own friends about 187 and just thinking it was such a nasty thing, because my dad, he came into this country illegally in the right. trunk of a Chevy, mm -hmm. so it was a very personal thing for me. Uh so, so, in looking back after that time, when you're kind of trying to put this all into perspective, does it surprise you that Orange County was where the Save Our State initiative started? No, it, it's funny because when people talk about this changing transfer, the changing demographics of Orange County, I didn't live it. Where I lived in Anaheim, it was always Mexicans. My, I, I see school yearbooks. I have a vague memory of when I was in uh, kindergarten, we got taken to the beach by seniors, who I'm assuming is from Anaheim High School. And I remember the seniors being very nice, and I also remember them being very white. So you see the years. As I go up every single year, the years below me are more and more Latino, mostly Mexican. The years above me are like the last white people. By the time I went to Anaheim High, it was like 90% uh, Latino. Now it's like 98% Latino. So I can't say I was surprised because I've lived, like I, I, I didn't realize there was white people in Orange County until I went to community college. Um, but given now from the, seeing it from, an, not from an outsider's perspective, but from objective perspective, I'm glad it happened in Orange County. I'm glad Orange County has changed the way it has. And I'm not surprised that Orange County had such a nasty streak of anti-Mexicanism because we never had a huge black community. So the Mexican population, not the Latino population, the Mexican population was a de facto uh, segregated community, the community that was looked down upon, the community that had to do the quote unquote menial work and the community that was racialized and demonized. So you're kind of at the, um, you're not at the crest of the demographic wave. It had kind of already passed and you're sort of riding it, right? It was, it was a Latino community that you grew up in more or less. I guess so, but that Latino, that Latino community had already existed in Anaheim because Anaheim, we all think of it as Disneyland, but it was the heart of citrus country. It was the heart where you had, they would import either braceros or immigrants, and so you grew up in these segregated colonias. My great grandpa and my grandpa, they came to Anaheim in the 1920s, and they grew up, my grandpa, he was 12 years old, he grew up in a segregated community, so he grew up surrounded by Mexicans. So I would say I was part of that demographic wave, but I was also part of that group that saw yourself from being completely ostracized living in ostracization and then being able to now be at the forefront of this modern day Orange County where we're not the plurality yet, but we're definitely the largest ethnic group. And probably in 10, 15, 15 20 years, we will be the plurality. Okay. <laughs> and so with that in mind, um, and again, I was, I was the political director of the California Republican Party in the late 90s. This is after the 187 stuff, after a lot of these things. There became a concerted push by Republicans in this county to recruit 
Asian candidates mm -hmm. in response to this massive loss and this kind of we fucked up thing with Latinos. How is that playing out? How do you see that? That tension? Is there tension or my? Oh, no, it? there's there's always been tension specifically in Little Saigon because Vietnamese Americans are very much like Cuban Americans in that they despise the Democratic Party because they think they're a bunch of communists. So when you had Vietnamese enter into electoral politics, they've all like they initially started as all Republican. To this day, the vast majority of them remain Republican. And the Republican Party, oh, they love Vietnamese, even though, you know, even though they despise them during the, you know, when they were refugees, they became the model minority for Orange County. They're the ones who joined the Republican Party. They're the ones who joined Yaf, you know, Yaffers, young American for young Americans for freedoms. And so they went up in the ranks. You have your, you know, Tony Lam was the first ever uh, council member in the United States of Vietnamese uh, descent. He was elected in Westminster. Then you have people like Van. Tran, Janet Wynn, Andrew Doe, moving up the ranks. What's interesting though in recent years, there's never been a Vietnamese American Congress member from Orange County. That's like the one seat they have never been able to be because for years, Little Saigon was also covered by Loretta Sanchez. So uh, Van Tran tried to beat her, she destroyed them. She destroyed all of these people. So there was that proxy war in Little Saigon between Vietnamese and uh, Latinos. Now though, it's Korean Americans. You have, you know, Young Kim took her seat from uh, Gil Cisneros, who Gil Cisneros was not from Orange County, but he represented Orange County. That's one seat. And then that same year, Michelle Steele, Basically, what, what, what no, Michelle Steele got Little Saigon from Loretta, was able to be, I can't remember who she beat, but now you have two Korean American women as the, as the bulwark for uh, Republicans in Orange County. Those are the only seats, by the way, that Republicans hold right now, Asian seats, um, and they're going to hold on to those seats as long as they want. There is, and even the Democratic Party, they've scaled back and they realize, well, there's not going to be a Latino who could beat them. We have to get our own Asian candidates, but in Orange County, as in LA, uh, more Orange County, the Democratic Party here has not done a good job of getting Asian Americans to, um, to become Democrats. Yeah, you're probably gonna have Kim Bernice win, run against um, Michelle Steele, but she's gonna get destroyed. Okay, so you're seeing, or at least predicting, that Democrats will have to get more active and aggressive with recruiting, identifying, supporting Asian candidates to be competitive in these seats, congressional seats? Not just congressional, even the supervisorial seat. Uh, Andrew Doe, you had a good candidate, uh, I think last election cycle, Sergio Contreras. This guy, born and raised in Westminster, served on the city council, served on the school board, good progressive Democrat, got destroyed by Andrew Doe in the supervisorial race. This time around, you don't even have, well, you have Francis Munoz, a uh, council member in Cyprus, running against uh, in, in the seat to replace Doe, but she stands no chance. It's gonna be, it's probably gonna be two Vietnamese candidates, Andrew Doe and Janet Wynn, oh, not, not Andrew Doe, uh, Van Tran and Janet Wynn. I think that shows that the, the, the Democrats, in Orange, in Orange County, the Republicans and the Democrats seem to get, seem to forget who the, should they be fostering. So Republicans forgot they should foster Latino candidates for a good generation. Now they don't even care, frankly, although I think it's gonna change. And Democrats, they forgot, okay, we have the Latinos. Well, they forgot the Asian vote. So they're always playing catch up here, both parties. That's just fascinating. I think it's unique from everywhere else in the country that we're looking at. That, that kind of, to me, is the future of ethnic politics, right? Is these both parties are gonna have to double down. And at the same time, we're also starting to see kind of a fusion, right? There's gonna be Asian, Hispanic candidates coming up at the same time, yeah. right? Yeah. And certainly voters. Yeah. Are we becoming as Latinos what we rallied and organized again? Absolutely. Yeah, we're all a bunch of sellouts now. Like we don't care about the Latino community anymore. Right. And I think that's a good thing. Like we should we should care. I've always said we should be class warriors, not race warriors. I, you know, the people the, you know, the, the people who live in the Mexican Beverly Hills, Downey, I don't I, I do not their views and their needs do not represent the views and needs of the people that I came from, working class Latinos. Like middle class Latinos and working class Latinos, they're gonna, we're gonna care about completely different things. I still care very much about immigration because I have uh, friends and family members who remain undocumented. If you're third, fourth generation, you're not gonna care about that at all. So am I going to be appealing to you because you're Latino or am I gonna try to be appealing to white, you know, uh, leftist white folks who might care a little bit more than the 
immigration, you know, than uh, vendidos about the immigration dilemma. And what's the answer? Uh, I'm going to go with the people who are ideologically like me more than the people who are ethnically like me. Always. That, and that, that's, I mean, that's profound, isn't it? To I, me, that's profound. Just as somebody who's spent the last 30 years sure. watching and getting a first on this city council and a first on that school board and watching the votes rally or not rally with low turnout, and now we're, we're kind of turning this corner and we kind, of, we, we're, we kind of feel like, yeah, that's the natural thing. It's not a big deal. That's a big deal, brother. You've been at this longer than me, so. Well, I'm a little bit older than yeah. you, or a lot older than you are. But yeah, I mean, that's a big moment where, where we're saying, let's move kind of beyond just the ethnic argument, and that's a good thing. It, it, it absolutely is a good thing. I still think we need to mark and celebrate when we achieve these accomplishments, like Alex Padilla being the first U.S. Yeah. Senator, both being appointed and then being elected as U.S. Senator. I still track, like, firsts as they yeah. slowly start coming down. I mean, there's not many firsts left for here in Orange County, um, except on the you know on the school on the school district level. But like, look, do we you know how much do we get from celebrating? Gracie Vandermark, she's the first ever Latina elected to the Huntington Beach City Council. She's the first ever Latina elected as mayor, and she's horrible. She's absolutely horrible. She's a Republican, Trumper, uh, alt loser, one thousand percent. So the old ways, we would celebrate her. But no one's celebrating her at all except Republicans. And, and, and that's the thing. I think most Latinos don't even realize that she's a Ecuadoriana from Linwood. Yeah. She has a great story, but we don't celebrate that story. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. I don't know. Because I, I, you know, to use a cliche that I hate, I do think she deserves her flowers, but those flowers deserve a lot of thorns too. <laughs> Gustavo's perspective on the Latino experience during the rollout of Proposition 187 is both poignant and heart-wrenching. But Latinos were not the only immigrants negatively impacted during this time. My next stop is in Westminster, California, an oft-forgotten town but a very important part of the political future of the county. Westminster has one of the largest Vietnamese populations in the United States, and the city is known as Little Saigon. With the rise of the new Vietnamese political players like Derek Tran and Tyler Deep, Westminster can no longer be overlooked. I'm driving through endless neighborhoods of one-story ranch-style homes on my way to see Christine Beek Tram Lee, the longtime hostess and political commentator for Nui Viet Daily News. I pull up to a small strip mall that houses the Vietnamese language newspaper and TV program and walk into the studio. As part of trying to understand the changing communities in Orange County, we wanted to come to speak to one of the faces of the community, Christina Lay, who is, again, one of a number of voices that speaks directly to the Vietnamese community here in Orange County that plays a particularly important role in understanding what this region of the state, Orange County, is and what it means and the politics of what that's about. But before we get into that, I'm hoping you can share with us a little bit about the origin story of the Vietnamese community here in Orange County, going back to about the 1970s, if I'm right, more or less. And maybe you can share with us how this story all began. Right. right. So um, first of all, hello. My name is uh, Christina Bichamle, and uh, we are appreciative of being a part of UCI's Red County, Blue County, Orange County project to examine the changing political landscape of Orange County specific to the Vietnamese American community. So thank you for inviting us to be a part of this. Uh, first of all, the overall community uh, as of 2023, we are 2.3 million Vietnamese living in the United States of which approximately 1.3 million are eligible to vote. Mm. Little Saigon, as it's known in Orange County, is made up of the cities of Westminster, Garden Grove, Fountain Valley, here in SoCal, and it's nicknamed the capital of Vietnamese refugees. Mm. And it's home to nearly 200,000 Vietnamese. Now, the diaspora originated in the 70s from three distinct waves. So we started migrating to America in large numbers 
in April of 1975, and that's when I came, at the end of the war, when the Republic of South Vietnam, so the, the southern part of Vietnam, fell to the communists. So by December of 1975, there were a total of about 130,000 mm. Vietnamese refugees who had resettled across the 50 states of America. Now, over time, we would relocate to areas with large populations of Vietnamese, and that's how ethnic enclaves were formed in states like California and, and Texas. Back in the 70s, when we first came, uh, so there was the Indochina Migration and the Refugee Assistance Act, right? So that was advocated by Senator Edward Kennedy and Congresswoman Lise Holzman. They were both Democrats. Whereas some conservative Republican congressmen at the time opposed it, they, cite, they cited concerns that refugees would not integrate well into the U.S. culture, and there was even a proposal to settle us in American territories. Hmm. Yeah. So then that bill passed with Democratic support, hmm. and Republican President Gerald Ford signed it in 1975. And what that bill did, it assigned refugee status to enable the newcomers to eventually qualify for citizenship. So it really paved the way for us to settle into a new land. And it allocated $455 million worth of aid for that first wave, the 130,000 refugees. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1987, Senator John McCain, a Republican, presented the American Homecoming Act, which allowed Amerasian children to settle in the U.S. And then in that same year, Senator Edward Kennedy led a bipartisan effort along with Congressman Bob Dornan, who's a Republican from California, to present a series of resolutions to Congress calling on Hanoi to release political prisoners so that they could resettle in the U.S. So it was this effort that paved the way for that HO, that humanitarian operation program, that brought hundreds of thousands of ex-military South Vietnamese and their families to America. While Proposition 187 was doing damage to the reputation of immigrants, a different sort of battle was going on in the political landscape of Orange County, one that would have seismic effects in the voter landscape. When a Latina Democrat, Loretta Sanchez, beats the bombastic Congressman Bob Dornan in a storied 1996 congressional race. We'll talk to Loretta Sanchez and get her take on what it meant to bring down an Orange County icon. Plus, another tectonic shift is looming on the horizon a transformation from a blue-collar manufacturing base to a high-tech workforce that will forever change the face of Orange County. But that's next time on Red County, Blue County, Orange County. You've been listening to Red County, Blue County, Orange County, a podcast series produced by UC Irvine School of Social Ecology. Thanks to all of our guests for appearing on this podcast to help us dissect what makes Orange County so unique. I'm Mike Madrid, and I invite you to subscribe to this podcast and check out our series at sites, S-I-T-E-S dot U-C-I dot E-D-U forward slash Orange County.